Well, good evening. Welcome again to our weekly prayer meeting. This is August 12th, 2020. So glad you could join us on our White Oak Baptist Church YouTube channel. And for our friends and regular attenders and members, I have again sent you an email with some updated prayer requests, and I hope that you can pray for those this evening as we meet together around God's Word. Let's open with a prayer. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity of prayer and for the access to the throne of grace that we have now through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn please to Philippians chapter 3. And last week we began a foray into the third chapter of Philippians, which Paul has given us. Let's just read the first six verses, and then we're going to take a concept from this passage, and we're going to go over to the book of Hebrews for a few minutes to look at the concept of Christian discipline. Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Then he goes on in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Moreover, than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Paul here is giving an exhortation, of course, to the Philippians. And one of the things he tells them is that to write the same things to you again is not a burden to him, and it's helping you. It's for your profit. It's for your benefit. And that got me to thinking about the concept of discipline and the concept of bearing hard things for the cause of Christ. Because Paul was willing to bear very hard things for his former religion, Judaism. Because to become a Hebrew of Hebrews, to become a Pharisee, he had to go through strenuous, difficult, and laborious study. He would have had to have memorized the entire first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. He would have had to keep very strictly all the minutiae of the law. And Paul was certainly an incredibly self-disciplined person. Well, then Paul and the other New Testament writers go on to say, those things are fine, but Paul says, I count them as loss for the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And now we have that kind of external self-righteous discipline to be replaced by a discipline of grace, a discipline that is brought to us by the Lord Jesus Christ for the purposes of holiness and for the purposes of joy two major themes in this book. Let's explore this concept in the book of Hebrews. If you have a, uh, your Bible in front of you, turn to chapter 12 of Hebrews. Chapter 12, we're going to look at uh, verses 4 through 11 very quickly um, as a bit of an illustration of what this passage in Philippians, I think, is talking about. In Hebrews chapter 12, we, of course, have had the great chapter 11 in which the apostle has put forward the heroes of the faith, in the first three verses, he has told us that we are supposed to take into account this great cloud of witnesses and that we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and run the race, the marathon that is the Christian faith. And then in verse 4, he says, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. 
for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father, whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, refer to the human fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline from the moment, for the moment, seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I used to teach a course in acting in my collegiate career, stage acting, and one of the quotations from the textbook I used years and years ago that has always stuck with me is this. Acting without discipline is exhibitionism. Acting without discipline is exhibitionism. This is from Hardy Albright. Or as my mom would have said, you're just showing out. So that anything that it's worth doing in life, including stage acting, requires serious discipline. Now let's take a look from Paul's perspective and from the writer of Hebrews' perspective, first of all, about the reality of discipline. Everyone faces some form of hardship. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation testing has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So notice what he says, all testing, hardship, discipline, if you will, that has overtaken you is common to man, common to people, not just common to Christians. But God has provided a way of escape so that the temptation, the testing, the hardship will not overtake you. You'll be able to bear it. And Peter tells us in his first epistle, chapter 4, in verses 12 through 16, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, a key theme of Philippians, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Do you see the link there? The link between discipline, hardship, persecution perhaps, and exceeding joy, a joy that will be revealed in the last day. <clears throat> Peter goes on to explain, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, the world's part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So when you are facing hardship, when you are facing difficulty, when you are facing discipline from the hand of God, it is a joyful thing that results in joy unspeakable and full of glory, and it's something that should cause us to glorify God in the matter. So everybody faces hardship. But only God's children are capable of really grasping it. First of all, we grasp it as a training process that results in strength. The uh, former football coach for the Dallas Cowboys, Tom Landry, said, Leadership is getting someone to do what they don't want to do to achieve what they want to achieve. Which is a little simplistic in terms of a definition of leadership, but it's really pretty good in some respects. It is the idea that we are putting people through the test. They're doing something that seems grievous for the moment in order that they achieve what they actually want to achieve. So a characteristic of God's people is 
They cry out. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. And now we know that that hungering and thirsting for righteousness causes us to endure hardships as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. You know, think about a classroom or a curriculum that never presents a new or more difficult concept. Everything's the same. Well, that person is not going to grow intellectually. And the the great things that I've achieved in terms of uh, education, great in the sense of great for me, is they have almost always come through having to grapple with something difficult, having to work through it, having to go off and walk in the woods and ponder it and think about it, having to come back and struggle with it. So we grasp it, hardship as a training process that results in strength, but we also grasp discipline, hardship, as a corrective process that sometimes rebukes and punishes sin. This passage in Hebrews tells us, you know, when we're parents and leaders, we must remember that when we coddle children, when we coddle those in our church, the result is weakness. On the other hand, Overly punishing children can result in discouragement, as Paul tells us. He tells fathers particularly, don't discourage your kids through harsh discipline. Andrew Murray puts it very well, I think. In every trial, small or great, first of all, and at once, recognize God's hand in it. Say at once, my father has allowed this to come. I welcome it from him. My first care is to glorify him in it. He will make it a blessing. We may be sure of this. Let us by faith rejoice in it. So we realize, first of all, that discipline is a reality in life. Everybody faces it, but only Christians can truly grasp it for the the character-building, holiness-developing aspect of the Christian life that it truly is. The scripture also, particularly in this Hebrews passage, gives us some reasons for discipline. What does the writer of Hebrews tell us? One of the reasons we face discipline is that it proves that we are in a relationship as children to our Heavenly Father. He goes on to say in the Hebrews passage, as you recall, that, you know, God is not really in the business of disciplining others, other people's kids, if you put it like that. I don't go around, you know, seeking to rebuke and reprove kids that I see misbehaving someplace in a store or at a restaurant. Sometimes I would like to but they're not my kids. On the other hand, when my children or grandchildren do something that uh, is less than uh, sterling, they're probably going to hear something from me about that. They're my kids. So discipline is to be rejoiced in because it actually proves that you're in a relationship with God the Father. But not only that you're in a relationship with Him, it proves the Father's love for you. Let's go back and look at that passage really quickly. The writer of Hebrews says, My son, don't regard the discipline of the Lord lightly. The Lord loves those he disciplines, and he scourges, he he disciplines, he brings rebuke to every son he receives. So when you have discipline come into your life, when you have a hardship, when you have a trial, even when you have a persecution, it is proof that the Father is yours and that the Father loves you. But that passage goes on to say the kinds of things that Paul is saying in Philippians. The reason I keep saying these things to you, the reason I keep bringing them up as a disciplining father is this. The result is that we partake in his holiness. The writer of Hebrews says, we partake in the holiness of God through the process of God's disciplining hand upon us. And that ultimately, we not only partake in his holiness, we participate in his joy. Or what he says, it is for discipline that you endure, and God deals with you as sons. Verse 10, for they, earthly fathers, discipline us for a short time as seem best to them, but he, God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. And verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, which child likes to be spanked, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We end up being participants in God's holiness and partakers of his joy. I like what J.I. Packer says. How does God in grace prosecute this purpose? Not by shielding us from assault, 
by the world, the flesh, and the devil, nor by protecting us from burdensome and frustrating circumstances, nor by shielding us from trouble created by our own temperament and psychology, but rather by exposing us to all these things so as to overwhelm us with a sense of our own inadequacy and to drive us to cling to him more closely. Packer goes on to say, this is the ultimate reason from our standpoint why God fills our lives with troubles and perplexities of one sort or another. It is to ensure that we shall learn to hold him fast. And God wants us to feel that our way through life is rough and perplexing so that we may learn thankfully to lean on him. Therefore, he takes steps to drive us out of our self-confidence, to trust in himself. And the classical scriptural phrase for the secret of the godly life, to wait on the Lord. So there's a reality of discipline, the reasons for it. What are some potential responses we might have to it? Well, one potential response we might just call stoicism, the Greek philosophy, which is sort of a grin and bear it, that we work through life, life is meant to be tough, stiff upper lip, suck it up. Okay, that only goes so far in bringing joy in life, and in fact, it doesn't bring joy. The opposite of that might be something like self-pity. The stoic is going to suck it up. The self-pityer is going to cry and whine and say, why me, why me, why me? The actual response is sonship. That is, we have earthly fathers who do their best to discipline us with greater or lesser degrees of success, but we have a heavenly Father who accomplishes the best for us. So our response is to go back to this. On the basis of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we are now children of God and heirs and joint heirs of Christ. That causes us to have a completely different mindset, a completely different worldview as it responds to trials, tribulations, uh, scourgings, persecutions, perplexities, uncertainties. When you know you are a son or a daughter of God, you now have a basis on which to handle it. And what are the rewards of discipline? Well, there's peace. Jesus Christ said before going away, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, do I give it to you. A.T. Pearson said, Peace of God is that eternal calm which lies far too deep in the praying, trusting soul to be reached by any external disturbances. And the Puritan Thomas Watson put it this way, God the Son is called the Prince of Peace. He came into the world with a song of peace, on earth peace. He went out of the world with a legacy of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Christ's earnest prayer was for peace. He prayed that his people might be one. Christ not only prayed for peace, but bled for peace. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, he died not only to make peace between God and man, but between man and man. Christ suffered on the cross that he might cement Christians together with his blood as he prayed for peace, so he paid for peace. Another reward is righteousness. True righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God. Or we might put it this way, the peace that is righteousness. Those are the two great rewards. You know, Paul in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2 goes to great lengths to remind the Thessalonian church what he did for them. Let's read these verses together. For 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 11. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. 
but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Note, first of all, Paul is talking about being a nursing mother. Verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Verse 9, for you remember, brothers, our labor and toil we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, like a mother, like a father, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What is Paul telling the Thessalonians? I came to you, in a sense, to bring the gospel and to promote godly discipline among you, and I appeared to you like a loving parent, both a mother and a father. And he's giving us a flesh and blood example of what it means not only to endure hardness, to endure discipline, but also how to administer it like a tender mother, like a loving father. You know, we're going through difficult times. Everybody knows that. And the approach to these times is based, let me say that again, the success in our spiritual lives of these times will depend on our approach to these times. If we approach these times of difficulty, hardship, uncertainty, perplexity, with a human, unbiblical stance, we'll find ourselves floundering and we will not grow. If, on the other hand, we approach them from the point of view of sonship or being a daughter of God, then we'll thrive, we'll be strengthened, we will grow. I'm praying for you all. I hope you have a wonderful week in Christ. And thank you for joining us. And be much in prayer for the church, for each other. God bless you all.